In the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful, uh, dear brothers and sisters, uh, a very good morning to you. On behalf uh, of the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies, I would like to welcome you at this uh, symposium entitled The Syrian Revolution, Seven Years On, What Went Wrong, whereby a constellation of researchers were invited, uh, academics, specialists in the Syrian uh, cause from the Arab world and uh, the rest of it. Uh, this is uh, an ad a research attempt uh, to uh, pose two major questions and answering them accordingly and objectively, however, perhaps in a biased kind of way. First, why the Syrian revolution that started in a civilized manner, calling for unity, democracy, and human dignity, as well as uh, political and uh, economic reforms, why it turned uh, ugly, why it turned into a proxy war whereby uh, half a million uh, uh, Syrians uh, met their end and uh, uh, millions uh, were IDPs and displaced as well all across uh, the globe. As a matter of fact, uh, destructions uh, uh, were afoot and uh, this uh, has uh, affected all sectors. Uh, so the question was, was it inevitable for such uh, a course? Uh, was it inevitable to get to such results? Or uh, perhaps if decisions were taken uh, differently, we would have seen different results. Uh, indeed, uh, this uh, question is uh, problematic because it is uh, hypothetical, first and foremost. Uh, it is difficult to answer such questions outside the context of the Syrian uh, uh, cause. And uh, on the other hand, uh, it uh, entails uh, uh, pinpointing the loopholes uh, in answering what went wrong, uh, uh, as the title suggests, as well as uh, uh, taking into consideration our responsibilities as Syrians, uh, the responsibilities of uh, the Arab world, the international community, especially the superpowers. So why uh, this uh, had taken place and uh, would it be possible to have avoided it? Uh, these are two questions uh, of this symposium and uh, uh, they uh, will be uh, resembling uh, determinant kind of uh, uh, points uh, whereby we could shed light on uh, the uh, conflict uh, itself which was indeed simmering under the surface and uh, was followed by the revolution uh, since its launch. And thus we will be tackling these issues on the aforesaid levels. We would like to uh, uh, scrutinize uh, the regime, the security of the regime, the strategies uh, it laid out uh, in order to uh, achieve uh, uh, its objectives and for it to survive. And also, we'll be talking about the structure of the opposition or the oppositions, as well as uh, uh, the objective thereby of toppling the regime and why it failed in toppling the regime, uh, despite uh, all the sacrifices that were uh, offered. On this level, we'll be talking about the political, socio-economic kind of uh, fabric and uh, talking about jihadists, uh, as well as some uh, 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 local kind of uh, uh, spaces that uh, we didn't mention before. As a matter of fact, we would like uh, uh, to talk also about the nature of the relationship thereby between the opposition and the regime, as well as the pursuit of uh, the change, uh, or perhaps uh, 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 cleaving to power, and uh, the uh, effect uh, by on the revolution itself, and the intervention of Russia and the USA militarily. Uh, brothers and sisters, uh, seven years ago, uh, the Syrians uh, summoned their courage and they were determined uh, and they surprised uh, the world uh, to launch the revolution which was postponed uh, decades. Uh, they were encouraged by the Tunisians, the Libyans and the Egyptians. Uh, and uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, this revolution was the latest in the Arab world. However, it was uh, the most solid because it uh, wanted to shake off uh, aggression uh, albeit uh, seven years later and uh, uh, after all the sacrifices, uh, this, this revolution uh, had no kind of uh, uh, tangible results. Uh, uh, it indeed broke the ice, if I might say, or uh, broke the wall of fear uh, 
However, uh, tyranny is still there. We have 26 research papers, and, do, and for the uh, following two uh, days, we would like to answer such questions that I have uh, laid out. And as a matter of fact, these research papers uh, will be published uh, in a book uh, launched uh, by our Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies. We hope that you will be successful, you will be frank, uh, and I would like to thank you all for your presence and peace be upon you. A very good morning to you. I would like to start first uh, 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 the, the first session, indeed. Whereby we would answer the following question. How did Syria turn into an, an arena of, for international conflict? We have three panelists. I would like to start with uh, Mr. Christopher Phillips, and uh, he's a, a fellow researcher at Chatham House and a senior lecturer in the international uh, relations at the uh, Mary's uh, St. Mary's uh, College, and he had a number of publications in the International Affairs, Third World Quarterly, as well as uh, Nations and Nationalism and Mediterranean Politics. Christopher, the floor is yours. Yes, please. Thank you very much, and um, thank you to uh, the Arab Center for inviting me. Uh, I am amazed and honored to be uh, surrounded by so many people I've been writing about for quite some time. Uh, uh, I uh, will attempt to um, talk a little bit about um, the, the subject of um, a book that I've written called the, the Battle for Syria, International Rivalry in the New Middle East, which very much focuses on the international relations of the conflict uh, and how uh, the conflict was internationalized. Uh, as uh, everyone is aware, uh, the Syrian civil war is simultaneously an internal struggle um, and an international proxy war. While the early years of the conflict, as Marwan was discussing, uh, were characterized uh, by uh, domestic aspects of the conflict being commented on, uh, it's interesting how since particularly the US's assault on ISIS in 2014 and uh, the Russian intervention of 2015, the focus has shifted more to the international dimension. I have argued for a long time uh, in both my book and in this paper that actually this should not be seen as a sudden shift, but actually rather the next step in foreign involvement in this conflict that in fact was present from the beginning. I don't think Syria's conflict is just a domestic civil war that has become a proxy war, but rather has had an international dimension from its very beginning. This is not to deny agency to either Assad or to his opponents, nor to indulge in any kind of conspiracy theories that either acted as an agent of a foreign power. But external factors have played a vital role in framing, enabling, and facilitating the conflict from the very beginning, not just being sucked in later on. And so in my paper, I outlined three ways uh, that these external factors played a leading role in escalating and shaping the conflict, utilizing both international relations and civil war theory. So I firstly look at the international and regional environment in which Syria's uprising began, arguing that the structural context was key in its transformation from uprising into civil war. Secondly, I examine the agency of leading foreign states particularly in the first year, suggesting that these governments helped to escalate uh, the uprising into civil war. And then finally, I explore how external actors shape the war uh, after it had broken out. So that first point uh, about the region changing. Uh, theorists of international relations, systemists, argue that when a regional order is shifting, the chances of conflict increases. And I would say that on the eve of Syria's unrest, the Middle East's regional order, that of US dominance, was changing, it was coming to an end. And new regional powers and non-state actors were battling to increase their position in what they perceived as a vacuum. Much of this was due to the 2003 invasion of Iraq by the United States and its consequences. One of those consequences was that US power uh, diminished. The failures in Iraq, 
shifted perceptions of US power. Despite a vast display of military resources, the US uh, had proved unable to create a stable and prosperous democratic ally in post-Saddam Iraq. This was furthered by the 2008 financial crisis, public war fatigue in the United States, and the coming to power of Barack Obama in 2009, who opposed heavy US involvement in the Middle East. As one scholar, Fawaz Jerzis, noted in 2011, the US is no longer seen as omnipotent and invincible. A second consequence was that the defeat of Saddam Hussein shifted the regional balance of power. The major beneficiary, as many people are aware, was Iran. Just as the US was deposing its enemy Saddam, the Iranian economy began to boom and a more expansionist group came to power in Tehran, taking the opportunity to advance Iranian interests in Iraq, Lebanon, and beyond. In reaction to this, Iran's rival, Saudi Arabia, also started to be more assertive in order to counter Tehran. Other regional powers asserted themselves as well. Turkey's AK party turned Ankara towards the Middle East for the first time in decades, whilst Qatar, bolstered by a gas boom, also raised its regional profile. Russia also took advantage of a more favorable geopolitical and economic climate to strengthen its ties to the Middle East after several decades' absence. The emergence of these multiple independent powers made the regional subsystem increasingly multipolar rather than the US-dominated unipolar system of the 1990s. A third consequence of the Iraq war was the growth of non-state actors. It's quite a tragic irony that the US invasion of Iraq, which was ostensibly to defeat Al-Qaeda and prevent it from acquiring weapons of mass destruction, actually proved a massive recruiter for regional jihadism. Similarly, Kurdish nationalism was greatly boosted by the creation of the KRG, inspiring Kurdish nationalists elsewhere. And both Kurdish and jihadist non-state actors, often operating from Iraq's ungoverned spaces, would play a major role in Syria's conflict. Now, alongside these regional shifts, Syria was also particularly badly placed geographically making it more susceptible to civil war. Civil war theorists note that in most civil wars, they're more likely to break out in states, neighboring countries with recent civil wars that share ethnic ties with people in those previous conflict zones. Syria, as we know, was terribly placed in this regard, neighboring and sharing ethnic ties with three states that had had recent civil wars, Lebanon, Iraq, and the Kurdish region of Turkey meaning that weaponry and weapon supply networks were easier to come by. So therefore, before we even start talking about the internal dynamics of 2011 Syria, Syria's uprising breaks out in what was already a very delicate international, regional, and local environment. Moving to my second point about how uh, external actors fan the flames of conflict in 2011. I am not saying that any of these regional or structural conditions meant it inevitable that Syria's uprising would transform into a civil war. A huge amount of blame needs to be attributed to domestic actors, most importantly the regime of Bashar al-Assad, which deliberately militarized the, the uprising as a survival tactic. However, external factors interacted with these internal components and leading states played a major role. Numerous studies have examined how domestic conflicts can be escalated by external powers, whether it's providing weapons or finance to either side, to encouraging allies to pursue a military solution to a dispute. In fact, some people have even argued that just the expectation of external support from domestic actors can lead them to prefer violence over compromise. And I would argue this is what happened in Syria. Though most of the regional players were initially cautious on Syria, distracted by events elsewhere in the Arab Spring, I think August 2011 turned to be a, 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 proved to be a key turning point when Obama, followed by other Western leaders, called for Assad to stand aside. However, 
Obama's view that I mentioned earlier uh, hadn't really changed. He didn't want the US to be sucked into another regional conflict. Whilst he had been persuaded to intervene in Libya, as that state descended into a degree of chaos afterwards, it reinforced the president's instinctive caution. Importantly, Obama made the demand for Assad to go with no intention of following it up with military action. In fact, importantly, the day after he called for Assad to stand aside, he went on vacation for two weeks to Martha's Vineyard. He miscalculated. He believed that the Assad regime was going to crumble anyway, and he wanted to appear on the right side of history when Assad eventually fell. Interestingly, this actually countered the more cautious advice that Western diplomats in Damascus were sending him even though they publicly supported the uprising. They actually told the capitals in the West that the Assad regime was still far from collapse, much to their disappointment. This illustrated a contradiction to Obama's Syria policy. On the one hand, he wanted to step back from the region, but at the same time, he repeatedly used the language of an aggressive hegemon towards Assad. A year later, uh, that I'm not going to go into it in detail here, in August 2012, he famously threatened Assad not to cross a red line on chemical weapons usage and then damaged his own credibility by not enforcing it. The impact of Obama's language in contributing to the slight of civil war, I don't think should be underestimated. Many believed after he called for Assad to stand aside that regime change in Syria was now US policy. So for Assad's allies, Iran and Russia, this persuaded the few doubters to fully get behind Assad, doubling down on their ally. Qatar, Turkey and later Saudi Arabia all stepped up their anti-Assad activity after Obama's statement. Each believed that the US would eventually send military support, as they had done in Libya, and so transmitted this message to newly formed militias inside Syria in the late 2011, early 2012 period. Crucially, I would argue at this point, each external power was convinced that military victory was both possible and the best option with Russia and Iran putting very little pressure on Assad, arguably the reverse, and Qatar, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia, and the United States are also adopting a confrontational approach. So I would say that from around mid-2011, external powers were therefore all in different way ways pouring oil on the fire of civil war rather than attempting to de-escalate. This brings me to my third and final point then, but once the war was underway, external actors shaped and impacted the conflict's character. Now, one example, as many people in this room will be aware, is how the anti-Assad states contributed to the divisions within the opposition, with the rivalry between Qatar and Saudi Arabia over the role of the Muslim Brotherhood particularly damaging. A similar story played out with the armed fighters. Qatar, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and the United States arguably exacerbated divisions by backing different armed groups independently, often bypassing bodies such as the Free Syrian Army Supreme Military Council that was set up to coordinate external support and forge unity. On the regime side, Iran shaped the war's character by contributing to its sectarianization. Assad himself manipulated fears of sectarian violence to persuade non-Sunni minorities and Sunni secularists to support him. But Iran added to this by bringing Shia sectarian militia from Lebanon, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan to fight in Syria, making the war seem more communalistic. It was not just states that shaped the combatants. Islamic State in Iraq, or ISI, and the Turkish PKK facilitated the rise, expansion, and military success of powerful groups like Jabhat al-Nusra, ISIS, and the PYD. Another way that states shaped the war was via direct intervention. Again, looking at past conflicts, we can see that whilst de decisive interventions on one side can hurry a conflict's end, balanced interventions, when actors intervene on each side, can lengthen the war by creating a stalemate. And this was the case in Syria. 
Assad's allies, Russia and Iran, gave him the tools to stay in power. Diplomatic support at the UN Security Council from Russia, economic assistance, arms and fighters, including IRGC Quds Force commanders, Iranian-sponsored Shia militia, and after 2015, the Russian Air Force. Assad's enemies were willing to give the opposition less than this, mostly just finance, weapons, and political support. But for the first years of the war, this was sufficient to balance out against the regime. In essence, external players on both sides gave uh, the Syrian fighters enough to keep fighting, but not enough to win, creating a stalemate. Indeed, the general pattern of the conflict was one of escalation and counter-escalation. When the rebels, for example, captured territory in 2012, the Iranian Quds Force and Hezbollah ordered a major reorganization of Assad's forces. When these reforms led to regime gains in 2013 and 2014, external backers sponsored the new Jaysh al-Fetah rebel coalition in northern Syria, which resulted in the capture of Idlib in early 2015. When this advance looked to seriously threaten Assad, Russia then militarily intervened that September. Now, whether this Russian move has been decisive is open to debate. On the one hand, it might be the decisive intervention that tips the scales heavily to Assad's side. On the other hand, the recent increased presence of US and Turkish forces in Kurdish areas could be seen as another form of counter-escalation, balancing and preventing the Assad-Russia-Iran alliance from reconquering all of Syria. Time will tell, but it is yet another sign of external players shaping the course of the war. So I'll conclude there then by just reiterating my main argument, that international dynamics have been at play from the very start of Syria's conflict, shaping and influencing the nature of the war. This does not absolve in any way the brutality of the Assad regime or others for atrocities, and it certainly doesn't belittle the struggles fought by the opposition. However, they have not operated in a vacuum and their actions have been facilitated and influenced by external actors. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, for this paper, where you have uh, uh, given us an overview uh, about the evolution of uh, what uh, went on in Syria. I would like to move to the second paper now. Uh, we'll be talking about the uh, evolution of the U.S. policy on the Syrian crisis, uh, delivered by our colleague Osama Aborshed, who is a non-resident researcher with the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies. He holds uh, a doctorate in political science and philosophy from uh, Lubra, uh, Lugbara uh, University in the UK and uh, currently uh, resides in Washington DC. He had published dozens of uh, articles and contributed to writing two uh, Arabic language books on Hamas uh, and the Jordanian Israeli trait. Uh, in the name of God, the most, Christ, the most uh, merciful, what was asked uh, to talk about is the evolution of the US policy on the Syrian crisis uh, during the last seven years. Uh, some of the points were actually uh, 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 covered by Christopher. I would like to touch upon them, however, I'll put them within an, an analytical kind of uh, uh, context so that we could understand the evolution uh, thereby and why the USA during uh, the Obama era or the uh, Trump era, why uh, did they take the stances that it took. Uh, at the outset, uh, the Syrian revolution since its launch uh, had resembled a dilemma for the uh, USA. The USA uh, was not able to put into place a crystal clear strategy to deal with the Syrian revolution. Uh, uh, during the uh, Obam, Obama's era as well as the Trump's era, however, they had in place perhaps strategies, if we might call them strategies, uh, perhaps they had approaches, uh, the better word to use approaches uh, to deal partially with some of the aspects of the uh, Syrian conflict. However, the USA did not uh, provide in any way or form a holistic strategy that deals with the uh, Syrian issue. Uh, 
Indeed, uh, uh, the approach was ambiguous, uh, hesitant, ambivalent, and confused. And we, if we uh, start from now and uh, uh, go back and look at the uh, Donald Trump's uh, uh, tweets uh, and uh, uh, announcements uh, whereby he contradicted the Pentagon and contradicted the uh, State Department by announcing that he will be withdrawing from Syria, uh, whereby uh, the army has said that the American task has not been ended yet. So this uh, uh, will uh, provide you uh, with uh, indeed um, a recipe for confusion uh, in the USA. And the question is why? We can provide two answers. First, that uh, uh, there is no uh, crystal clear uh, uh, conception on the part of the USA as to what it needs. Uh, does she need uh, a status quo or does she need uh, the asset to be toppled or so on and so forth, uh, there is no crystal clear kind of answer. The other issue is the following. The USA has argued uh, time and time again uh, by saying that it cannot uh, make a change on the ground. As Barack Obama used to say, there is no military solution. And today we see the confusion uh, floating as well. As a matter of fact, when it comes to uh, the uh, national security uh, uh, team's members, uh, they do say that uh, the uh, quick exit from Syria will allow for Iran to spread its tentacles as well as provide uh, more uh, strategic space uh, for uh, ISIS in order to uh, reappear again, albeit this president is still talking about withdrawal within six months. and. Uh, uh, Obama has had participated in uh, uh, creating uh, such status quo. We might put things in different context. We might say that the USA uh, is uh, uh, looking at the matter uh, through an internal kind of debate because of what took place in Afghanistan, in Iraq, uh, indeed, which affected the morale of the army and affected the economy as well. Obama uh, used to talk about uh, 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 being uh, introvert rather than extrovert. He wanted to look uh, uh, at the internal problems and Obama and Trump has said also America first. This is his emblem. This is his slogan. So Donald Trump said why do we have to spend seven trillion dollars in Syria and build bridges in Raqqa and why don't we build bridges in Wisconsin for example as he said. So here we are talking about uh, 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 the lack of the holistic kind of view of what takes place in Syria, whereby uh, leaderships are put under the limelight, under the scrutiny of the public. If we go back to Obama, oh, as I said, Obama had uh, started uh, hesitant uh, with uh, the uh, Syrian revolution. At the outset, he didn't talk about uh, the departure of the Assad uh, per se. He uh, said that uh, Assad used to lead the reform in Syria and without uh, delving into the nitty-gritty of the details, in August 2011, uh, the Assad was delegitimized. Obama has called upon uh, al-Assad to uh, resign, but this didn't take place. Uh, aggression uh, uh, was uh, followed and brutal killing as well. The other milestone is uh, very important, uh, which will uh, uh, define the degree of the hesitation on the part of the USA. Obama in uh, 2012 uh, uh, had talked about the red line without uh, uh, agreeing with his advisors. Uh, he himself uh, confessed that. He said that the use of the chemical weapon is a red line. And indeed, in August, in August 2013, it was used and Obama didn't resort to the military force. Chuck Hagel, his uh, defense uh, secretary, said that this is a blunder on the part of Obama, albeit he was uh, opposing the red line itself. But he said that uh, uh, his uh, 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 talk rang hollow. Uh, the head of the superpower, the head of the USA, if he uh, doesn't walk uh, the walk, if he only talks the talk, then uh, this will lead to nowhere. And indeed, uh, this had led to the retreat of the USA.
the USA had retreated when it comes to its volition, or its de determination. It is hesitant now in launching wars and so on and so forth because of the uh, of the Iraqi war and because of the memory of Afghanistan and what took place uh, in Iraq, uh, whereby the politicians wanted to withdraw and or in order to rebuild the USA itself. So, as far as uh, Obama is concerned, uh, Obama didn't have a crystal clear. Uh, uh, approach and when he talked about uh, uh, the asset being departing uh, was also ambivalent because I see some of the faces here uh, who were uh, negotiators and you do understand the details of uh, uh, the uh, uh, of Kerry in March 2015 when he talked about uh, accepting the Assad and negotiating with him and then the retreat thereby on such announcement saying that the USA uh, is adamant on uh, Al-Assad being delegitimized and he ought to depart and in 2015 the Americans uh, uh, put pressure on the uh, opposition in order to reform the uh, the Riyadh delegation and talking about uh, the uh, the Assad as a part and parcel of the transitional period. So uh, uh, the USA up to this moment is hesitant, is confused, and this had led not only to uh, divisions in with or perhaps uh, uh, rows with uh, uh, Turkey and the Saudis. Uh, uh, Laurent Fabius, uh, uh, for example, the French minister, talked about the ambiguity of the foreign policy, the American foreign policy, and this had uh, indeed uh, uh, robbed uh, uh, more uh, salt into the wound. And uh, indeed, the Europeans uh, were used to complain because of such ambiguity. And uh, uh, Kerry's uh, announcements and declarations is emblematic of that, uh, uh, talking about uh, Russia and using the Syrian revolution, uh, Syrian refugees as a weapon, and this has been uh, has been uh, uh, reflected in the uh, USA policy. David Petraeus, uh, who used to, to head the uh, uh, intelligence, uh, the Central Intelligence, and uh, with the support of Hillary Clinton, who was the uh, uh, State Secretary, uh, he wanted uh, a selected uh, opposition, and Obama refused. And then uh, Kerry uh, uh, chastised the uh, Obama's. Uh, uh, administration and he wanted to bombard the uh, uh, regime's airports and Obama refused and Chuck Hagel then he also criticized uh, the uh, Americans and he said uh, that uh, 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 they committed certain mistakes so now how could we understand the uh, US uh, uh, strategy. I would like to talk about three stages. The first one is from uh, the launch of the revolution up until 2014, Jul 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 July 2014, and then up until September 2015, and then up to uh, uh, the beginning of uh, 2017 uh, and the uh, 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 end of Obama's era. Since March uh, 2011, what took place is uh, uh, the vacuum uh, that was uh, uh, created and filled by ISIS in uh, uh, June 2014. We do we do recall that ISIS uh, claimed uh, huge swath of uh, uh, areas and it uh, proclaimed the Khilafah, the Caliphate. And in September 2015, uh, Obama had in place a strategy and it talked about uh, the Syrian cause. It talked about it from two kind of uh, points. Sorry, in 2011, we talked about um, economic kind of sanctions uh, uh, leveled uh, uh, against uh, the regime. And uh, the Americans used to talk about the change of the formula on the ground through uh, uh, providing arms to the oppositions. However, it wasn't a lethal kind of, uh, it wasn't lethal uh, weapons. So we come to ISIS uh, and its invasion to that part of the world. He had strategies that is twofold. First, uh, he uh, 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 created uh, uh, a global alliance uh, to target uh, ISIS and he appropriated the uh, half uh, uh, half a billion uh, dollars uh, for supporting the opposition. However, the this was a failure. As I said 
Chuck Hegel said that if you bombard ISIS and uh, uh, this will lead to weakening the opposition because the opposition will be uh, working as a proxy to the Americas or to the other uh, 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 kind of uh, 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 countries. The appropriation of half a billion was also a failure because they wanted to train 5,000 and they wanted to, to, to uh, for them to undergo vetting. Martin Dempsey, who used to be the head of the uh, uh, army, he said that we need 15,000 and we need three to five years to train them. And then they also they only train only scores of these oppositions uh, who were killed or partially surrender surrendered themselves or uh, being captive becoming captives by ISIS. Uh, so this had led to the escalation with Turkey and everybody knows what took place at this milestone. However, the third stage, and because focusing on ISIS, in 2015 in September, Russia has jumped on the bandwagon and it exploited the vacuum uh, left by the USA. Uh, Russia came and filled in the vacuum and uh, the regime was on the retreat. Iran uh, was a failure in supporting the regime and the militias on the ground uh, uh, didn't lift a finger in this regard. The Russians came and saved the regime and Barack Obama talked about the quagmire of the Iranian-Russian uh, cooperation and he said that this will lead to a failure. So he said that the Russians uh, uh, interfered because of the crisis. But the outcome was that, uh, that Russia uh, transformed the formula and Obama failed in his conjecture. He said that uh, Bashar will fail and the regime will be toppled. No, Aleppo uh, uh, was uh, uh, indeed uh, kind of uh, liberated uh, on the part of the uh, regime and uh, then Russia came along and it was or it became a reality uh, in uh, on the land and in air and uh, via the sea. So all the solutions that uh, were floated including the, the, the Putin Barack Obama agreement uh, was uh, tilting to the benefit of the uh, of Russia because uh, uh, the because Al Assad was uh, entrenched uh, uh, following that agreement, partially, albeit uh, he uh, uh, became part and parcel of the transitional period. Obama used to say that he is uh, uh, he ought to be delegitimized and he is not the uh, uh, he is not capable of leading Syria and so on and so forth. However, later on, uh, Al Assad uh, became a reality. So the upshot of all. Uh, 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 the aforesaid uh, is as follows. Uh, in June, uh, in 2016, we had uh, witnessed uh, a document that was uh, uh, signed by 51 diplomats uh, uh, in Washington who supervised the Syrian dossier and who uh, uh, claimed that the USA administration had no vision for Syria and because it did not bombard uh, uh, Syria then it weakened the opposition and had no vision in dealing with oppositions themselves because uh, Obama said these opposition uh, leaders are pharmacists, are physicians and uh, uh, are not capable of uh, 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 making change. So the upshot was as follows. Obama at the end of his era, uh, uh, when he talked about leadership rather than uh, being uh, complicit, uh, uh, he wanted to support what went on in Syria, but he sent indeed the forces uh, to the north of uh, Syria, and uh, uh, he became uh, uh, complicit in Syria and Iraq because he had no vision in the first place. Uh, today we are talking about another administration and this administration had um, a strategic vision in place uh, uh, dealing with uh, Syria on the hand of Rex Tillerson in January in Stanford uh, University and he talked about five points uh, and on such speech uh, in Stanford in January this year Donald Trump uh, uh, had endorsed uh, to uh, be victorious uh, over ISIS, whereby Syria cannot become a sanctuary. Uh, 
This is first. The second one is uh, to have a diplomatic uh, solution in accordance with 2254, whereby Syria is unified uh, post Assad. Thirdly, to accommodate uh, Iran and uh, to accommodate what he called the Shia crescent. Uh, from Iraq to Lebanon. Fourth, uh, to uh, uh, for the displaced uh, uh, persons and refugees to return. And fifth, uh, for Syria to be void of uh, WMD. So these the f these are the five points that Donald Trump endorsed. However, when Donald Trump had read in the news that uh, uh, 200 millions will be appropriated for this recovery then he was outraged as if he didn't know that uh, uh, this kind of uh, money will be appropriated uh, indeed he uh, was uh, angry because of McMaster because McMaster want, uh, uh, splits hers he wanted to go into the details and Donald Trump didn't want that that's why he sacked him so uh, in uh, uh, the uh, Kuwait uh, conference, uh, the USA uh, pledged to pay 200 million. So he was outraged and he wanted to uh, uh, withdraw from this commitment. So the strategy became hollow, and even the Shuairite airport bombardment was wasn't within wasn't in accordance with his strategy but he wanted just to say that i'm different from obama i uh, talk the talk and i don't just uh, uh, i rather walk the walk i uh, i don't just talk the talk so uh, uh, indeed uh, uh, trump uh, wants to withdraw from the uh, uh, iranian deal in may and uh, as a uh, an Israeli intelligence uh, officer said that uh, uh, the war starts from Syria, but he wanted to withdraw. Also, he wanted for the Russians to entrench their presence. Uh, indeed, he, want, uh, he wants also to be different from Obama. He wanted to transform what he says into uh, tangible results and he says that uh, the uh, 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 resurgence of ISIS is because of Obama but now we say that he himself Donald Trump uh, repeats himself and makes mistakes and makes blunders so the strategy is not there uh, this is the uh, bottom line uh, regardless of uh, being influential on the ground and regardless of having a vision for post uh, for the post asset period or not being uh, or not wanting to be complicit in the civil war what i would like to say that the strategy is lacking uh, with the presence of assad or the departure of assad or with uh, him uh, being partially part and parcel of the transition period and this uh, would make uh, the would make the, 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 the issue contentious uh, uh, because America itself uh, cannot uh, understand itself. Thank you. Thank you, Osama, for your presentation on the absence of an American strategy in Syria. Now we have the third paper in this session. Dr. Mahmoud Al Hamza will be talking to us about the Russian approach to the Syrian crisis, drivers, consequences, and prospects for a resolution. He is a professor of mathematics. He resides in Moscow now, and he's been in the academia teaching and writing since 1985. And he has uh, many publications. Uh, to his credit in politics as well as mathematics. Mr. Mahmoud, the floor is yours. Thank you, first of all, for this kind invitation. It's, this is a very important event indeed. My, I am in a little bit more difficult uh, situation because Russia plays a major role in the Syrian crisis, unfortunately, and I reside there. But nonetheless, before delving into any details, I think we must take some steps backwards. Uh, many may not be aware of the background of the Russian position. You know, there was the Soviet Union, which was communist in ideology, and it was a dictatorial system. 
the Russian mentality from the days of the Tsars to the Soviet Union, they always believed in the strong ruler, ruler attitude who they believed in and accepted what he said. The 1990s were a period of chaos with the beginning of the process of democratization and liberalism, but in a rather distorted way, unfortunately, because the mafia, the former um, businessmen, uh, police officers, uh, and uh, some Jewish uh, uh, owners of capital, and there was a lot of chaos. The Russian public ended up hating anything to do with revolution or democratization. And we know what happened in Georgia and the Ukraine and other places, which had also a negative impact. In 2000, Putin came to power, and he started a centralized, strong state. For this reason, he crushed the opposition in Chechnya, and he said, if we do not destroy the Chechen revolution, the Russian state would collapse, and we must uh, stand up to the Islamist uh, threat, and there are, uh, there are many millions of Muslims living in in Russia, of course. Putin, after he, he came to power, he started thinking seriously of restoring uh, Russian, Russia's prestige. And you know, the United States became the dominant power and the world was no longer uh, bilateral, polarized in a bilateral way. Russian from 2000 to 2007. 2007 said we no longer accept the unipolar world and we will defend our uh, uh, interests and the world is no longer a unipolar system. For this reason, he started increasing uh, spend expenditure on the defense, education, etc., strengthening his armed forces. Uh, the biggest event, so far as Russia is concerned, in fact, uh, is what happened in Libya. Dmitry Medvedev was president then and not Putin. Putin was prime minister. Medvedev at that time uh, decided that Russia should abstain from uh, the, the vote at the Security Council, so the re re resolution was passed, and which really infuriated Putin. He said, this is another crusade uh, happening against Libya, and it was a big mistake that Russia did not use its veto power to stop the, the Western moves into uh, Libya. We remember what happened in the former Yugoslavia, in Afghanistan, in Iran, when uh, Russia lost uh, a lot economically. The Russian companies lost a lot in Libya and Iraq and elsewhere. And, of course, the essence of Russia's foreign policy is based on economic interest. And so much so that an expert said that the military complex, the energy complex, and oil companies are the ones who rule Russia. And, and this may explain the reasons behind the Russia's interventions outside its borders. There are geopolitical considerations and economic considerations, and there are there are other agendas similar to Iran's agenda. We, we say that Iran has a sectarian agenda and also an, an imperialist missionary role as defenders of the Shiites. Russia also sees itself as a defender of the Eastern Christian Church and in the, uh, in the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union, a strong nationalist trend uh, 
uh, um, came into existence in Russia, which was supported by even the communists. And this uh, explains why they interfered in Georgia and annexed two republics because uh, they have uh, a majority of Russians living there. And this is very frightening because Putin can interfere in any uh, republic on the, the same pretext. And the Ukraine was also a turning point. And the, what happened in the Crimea when Russia annexed that, and uh, which was the cause for sanctions, which uh, Russia now is uh, really uh, suffering from and many businessmen, maybe over, over a hundred of businessmen who are very close to Putin were subject to these sanctions and only yesterday another list was added and the more the sanctions are tightened, the more Putin becomes uh, adamant and he wants to prove to his population that we are faced with outside threats with uh, like uh, ISIS and the West and so it's no surprise that the majority of the Russians support Putin and this is out of convi con conviction despite their economic difficulties because they see in him a strong man, a strong personality who can stand up to outside pressures. So uh, whenever I, when I meet a Russian and he knows I'm from Syria, he, they immediately say, we know what the atrocities the Americans are committing in your country. They see, they understand the, the opposite picture because they only follow the state-run media and everything that happens in Syria is turned upside down on the Russian media and I took part in many television shows. I could only speak for two minutes uh, and still they, they, when I say when I say to them that you are supporting a dictator in Syria, they all immediately turn against me and start attacking me to the point of almost wanting to beat me up for my uh, answers. And uh, the Russian public really is fully charged with this attitude of, which is something similar to the Cold War attitudes. And uh, I may give one example of what Prim Evgeny Primakov, who is probably uh, the most well-known Russian Orientalist, he died recently. At the beginning, he welcomed the revolutions in Egypt and Tunisia, said these are revolutions as a result of social economic factors, and he sympathized with them. Yet Libya and Syria are different because he said in Libya and Syria there is an armed component and there's outside intervention. So his attitude became closer to that of the Russians. Alexander Dugin is another Russian philosopher who said that our battle in Syria will determine the future of a multilateral system in the world. Unless we support the Assad regime and prove that we are an active, powerful actor, then we will, can never restore our prestige and our standing in the world, and America will be uh, dominant. Dugan, they, they say, has a lot of influence on Putin. Unfortunately, the Russian intervention in Syria, you know what happened, but one of the main reasons behind it is that Putin wanted to use the Russian car to solve the Ukraine problem because the Western pressure vis-a-vis -vis the Ukraine was very strong, and I hear that from reliable Russian diplomats that the Russians said if you cancel the Minsk agreement of the sanctions, we will give concessions on Syria. 
So this may be an indication that they do not really worry about Syria, the country or the regime or the people, but they are in the Middle East for a different game altogether. In this reason, in my opinion, the Russians committed severe, very big mistakes. They did not achieve much in Syria. Yes, they have military bases now and they um, struck deals and agreements with the Syrian regime. But the question is, what will happen after that? How can they protect their interests in Syria and how can they enhance stability? If there is no stability, there will be no uh, restructuring, rebuilding, and and now that operations against ISIS are almost finished in, in their entirety, the Russians are seriously considering leaving and exiting Syria. They want uh, a solution whereby they can guarantee their presence and their interests. And they know full well that Bashar al-Assad will not be the man who can help them in the future. But unfortunately, they are adamant on, on, on the face of it in the media. They will not admit to this publicly, but uh, I think uh, behind closed doors, they are looking for an exit strategy to guarantee their interests in the future. Uh, going back to Russia and the Syrian revolution, Russia right from the start, as was said by Lavrov in, 2000, in February 2011, he said he does not welcome the Arab revolutions. Right from the start, Lavrov does not welcome it, although some Orientalists welcome the revolutions in Tunisia and uh, Egypt. In fact, there were demonstrations that in, in the autumn of 2011, more than 100,000 Russians took part in, and they were impacted by the Arab Revolution. They, they raised slogans similar to that of the Arab Revolution, and many young activists who led this agitation and demonstrations against the regime were arrested, and the, most of them are still uh, behind uh, prison bars. In 2012, Putin wrote a famous article entitled uh, Russia and the Changing World. He said, our economic interests in the world are threatened, and therefore we are entitled to use force to defend our uh, interests. By the way, this central theme of Russia's right to use force anywhere in the world to defend its development and its economy. This is part and parcel of the Russian national security and defense strategy, and they try and implement it uh, always. This is on the one hand. On the other hand, I remember Putin said something very striking. Maybe this was around 2012. He said the battle in Syria is a battle of the secularist regime of Syria. This also sheds light on the other aspect, the missionary, sectarian, and the Russia's support for the Shiite Crescent. Putin in 2012 said the, the Syrian regime is the last secular re regime in the Muslim world, and we must protect it and safeguard it by all means and any means possible. Otherwise, there will be Sunni regimes, and the minorities will be threatened and killed. And he specifically mentioned the Alawites. This is a, a statement by Putin. And by the way, the Russians used many cards in, in their intervention in Syria. They used the Christian minorities card. Even at the, at the UN, they organized events in defense of Syrian Christians. 
they said once that 50,000 Syrian Christians want to immigrate to Russia. They use the Kurdish, uh, the Russian stance vis-a-vis -vis the Kurdish problem is rather strange. They only talk about a Kurdish problem in Syria. They totally ignore the same thing in Iraq and in Turkey because in Syria they can manipulate that politically and utilize it to their advantage. And you remember how Russians insisted on the Kurds being represented in the negotiations and the PYD and YPG, but uh, lately they, they gave up on the uh, by the PYD, they gave up on them. So they play on that note too. And <coughs> Russia, in my estimation and in conclusion, they are facing a real crisis in Syria. And this quagmire that they got themselves into was as a result of a very smart American and Israeli Israeli plan. The Russians thought they will flex their muscles and they demonstrate the usages of the 200 different weapon systems. I think the Americans paved the way for them until they were lured into the Syrian trap. Now, this is the biggest question facing the Russians is how to get out now. Thank you, Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, Thank you, uh, Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, talking about the motives uh, of uh, the Russians uh, in the uh, Syrian dossier, I would like to open the floor for uh, the ladies and gentlemen. If you could ask uh, your questions succinctly, please. Dr. Yahya. A very good morning to you. Assalamu alaikum. As far as uh, the uh, ambiguous uh, US policy vis a vis Syria and the quotations uh, thereby that you have uh, uh, provided uh, to us uh, on the part of Obama and Trump. I don't want to talk about the conspiracy theory perhaps uh, the conspiracy theory uh, uh, we can't depend on uh, in this uh, context uh, because uh, it might be short-sighted in analyzing what goes on because it is not effective But in accordance with uh, our analysis, uh, indeed, uh, we uh, understood that uh, the policy was ambivalent. Uh, it followed the roller coaster of emotions. Uh, however, I think that it ought to be crystallized because it uh, tapped into the uh, very influential elements in the uh, in, in Syria perhaps it is uh, uh, it has been called uh, driving from behind however the ambiguity itself and the ambivalence uh, itself is a strategy. It is a very deep strategy whereby they could use uh, uh, proxies uh, for their uh, own uh, interests, especially when we take into consideration the strategic uh, interests of Russia, of America, sorry, in the area, uh, despite uh, the fact that uh, they uh, left no stone and turned uh, in order perhaps uh, 
to dissociate themselves uh, uh, from the uh, energy in this uh, part on, of the world, uh, as well as uh, 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 taking into consideration uh, what goes on in Israel. However, uh, perhaps uh, uh, this region, uh, through uh, uh, certain think tanks, uh, would like to say that America understands that this region is the historical gate for the world. Uh, but still, uh, there are contradicting uh, uh, statements, uh, and uh, <laughs> just I would like to give you an example, just to be brief. Russia has uh, uh, accepted to perhaps uh, uh, shuffle the cards uh, when it came to the uh, Syrian-related UN resolutions. Perhaps uh, this is a feature of uh, the crystallization of the American strategy vis-a-vis -vis Syria. If uh, there was uh, uh, a different stance taken by the USA uh, for such resolutions, perhaps uh, the Syrian uh, uh, course would have been different. Thank you. <coughs> Dr. Abdel Basit. <coughs> Thank you. I would like just to pose uh, uh, some questions uh, for the panelists uh, who presented us with uh, in, uh, invaluable uh, uh, papers. Uh, Mr. Christopher, I would like to uh, uh, pose uh, a question vis-à-vis -vis the weak stance on the part of the Europeans. Yes, perhaps uh, uh, America is headed by a weak uh, leader and Russia is headed by a strong one, and that's why uh, we have seen uh, a showdown. However, Europe uh, and the Europeans uh, had a great experience in this regard, especially Britain and France. Uh, they knew that uh, uh, they will incur harm uh, because of terrorism and the lack of stability and the lack of development uh, in uh, the Middle East. Uh, however, they were also hesitant. They uh, wanted to see what goes on in America. And after they uh, understood the American stance, uh, they have left no finger. Uh, this is a question mark. Could you answer, please, uh, uh, this uh, issue? When it comes to Osama, you were uh, dead right in your uh, uh, presentation. However, there is also uh, a question here. The relationship thereby, or perhaps uh, the adoption of the uh, PYD by America, at, uh, at some stage the Americans used to say to the PYD, we can cooperate with you, but you need uh, to be crystal clear in your stance with the regime and the opposition. However, after uh, what went on with ISIS and the lack of the American strategy, the Americans, what I meant to say, is uh, uh, that uh, uh, their relationship with Turkey has been uh, frickly, uh, especially also with the National Kurdish Council uh, that they wanted uh, uh, to uh, uh, incorporate uh, with the Etilaf, with the coalition, with the opposition. And this was also blessed by the uh, Iranians and the Russians. So the Americans themselves are uh, perhaps uh, shooting themselves in the foot, if, if I might say. Uh, any explanation in this uh, regard? Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Doctor Mahmoud, also, I uh, uh, wanted you to uh, talk about the uh, sustainability of the honeymoon between Russia and Iran, uh, especially uh, when it comes to uh, what we've seen lately, because there are in contentious issues between the two as well. Dr. Luay Safi and then Khalid Khoja, please be succinct uh, and brief. <coughs> 
very important papers uh, indeed in understanding uh, the international perspective uh, and the relationship thereby with uh, Syria. However, you didn't answer a major question, uh, i.e., why the Western democracies uh, can't support uh, a real uh, transformation or democratic transformation in Syria. I got two questions. The first question is uh, uh, does it relate to uh, uh, what Dr. Uh, Osama has uh, uh, said, whereby he said that uh, the American vision is lacking, the comprehensive uh, American vision is uh, uh, lacking, and uh, I support what Dr. Yahya has said. This is not enough to uh, uh, interpret what the American wants. What the Americans want. So, uh, and you do understand that uh, think tanks in America play a major role. We might say that the opposition uh, has uh, no uh, critically and comprehensive vision. However, in America, the foreign policy uh, is affected by think tanks, by uh, uh, people who do understand what goes on in the world. So, my question is. If the Americans are hesitant uh, on the face of it, would it be possible for this to be part of the strategy itself that relates to a certain important issue? In Syria, we had no liberal kind of forces that conform to the uh, American vision or the Western vision to what uh, might follow in Syria. Uh, uh, so that uh, Syria can transform itself. So the 